What we often try to do when we try to get someone to change their behavior or believe something different is we tell them why their behavior is wrong. And all that is doing is just forcing them to then defend the beliefs and assumptions that they have. So the way that I think about it, and I did learn this from Challenger, so I want to give credit where credit is due, is if you think of it like an iceberg, the, the behavior is what you see on top of the water. Beliefs and assumptions are underneath it. Before I can get anyone in the world, my freaking kids, to change their behavior, I have to introduce information that contradicts their beliefs and assumptions. Because it has to be their decision to realize this belief and assumption that I've been holding is in some way logically flawed. Welcome to the Rising Leader Podcast, bringing forth the new wave of rising leadership and helping leaders find purpose, connection, and results. This is your host, founder of Alluviance, Alex Kremer. All right, welcome back to the Rising Leader Podcast. And if this is your first time being on the show, we welcome you. We are so grateful that you are here. We have a professional in the art of podcasting now. I don't know if I'm at, if that, that's true. There's truth to it. Uh, <laughs> Jen Allen Knuth. First off, Jen, what is up? Welcome to the show. Very glad that you are here. I am so excited to be here. I have to say, you just have the most natural podcasting voice. Like I could put you on and just like probably feel very at peace with myself listening to you. So this is, you're a natural. One of these days, I'm going to like do what Matthew McConaughey did and start to read bedtime stories. <laughs> that way, you know, people can just go to sleep listening to my voice all by them. <laughs> I'll be customer number one. <laughs> there you go. Um, so just a, a little background and then Jen, I'll, I'll let you kind of fill in the blanks with whatever I, I miss. So um, you are a former chief evangelist and seller at Challenger or the Challenger Sales Methodology you spent quite quite a bit there and are a professional, so to speak, in the art and the craft of influence is what I'm going to say. Uh, you're a co-host for one of the best sales podcasts out there, the 30 Minutes to Presidents Club. Uh, I was on your guys' show a month, two months ago, something along those lines. I had such a, a ton of fun. Um, and, uh, you know, besides that, I think the coolest, not maybe not the coolest thing, because there's a lot of cool things that you do, but one thing that now you are entering into is... Uh, you just started Demand Gen, uh, and you are a, a professional speaker, a keynote speaker. I have been lucky enough to be in the audience for some of your speeches <laughs> and keynote talks that I've absolutely loved. You bring such good energy and all that, um, and I'm just really grateful for you to, to be here and us to jam out a little bit. Oh my gosh, I'm going to call you every morning and just have you hype me up. This is like <laughs> such a feel-good moment. Thank you. <laughs> So I guess, let me, let me just throw this out there. Did I miss any cool things about who Jen is? Any like cool, unique, random facts? You're like a professional pickleball player. Like you also, <laughs> I just went out that one out there. But <laughs> I feel like I'm like the only person on the planet that has not played pickleball. So I'm not a professional pickleball wow. player. I think maybe the um, fun fact or interesting thing about me is um, more to do with my personal life. So I, as you mentioned, was a sales rep forever. I was actually like not married forever. I just got married in March. I'm 42 years old. So in many ways, I don't fit the traditional mold of, you know, meeting someone in your 30s and being happily married. And I think that's really influenced my career quite a bit and the choices I've made. Um, but yeah, I'm a new stepmom um, of four kids and a whole bunch of animals. So that's wow. my, that's my unique thing. That's a completely different life. Like you, you saying <laughs> that you got married, I'm like, oh, that's cool. Like there's, but then when you throw in and I'm, you step on to four kids and there's a whole bunch of animals. Like that's not just like a change in identity. That's a change in complete lifestyle right there. Uh, yes, that is an understatement. You go from living a life that's all about yourself and maybe your friends and you'd be selfish and then plopped into a totally different lifestyle. So it's, it's mm. definitely been transformative. Mm. Well, one thing I, I really resonate with what you you know spoke to right there is this idea of you've lived just the life that you felt like was true to you, and you know not trying to fit into a certain box or at least try not to do it as as best as possible, uh, but kind of just own your own journey. And I think that's extremely hard for many people who are in corporate, for many people who. Uh, are, are in sales who are wanting to move up to leadership, who are wanting to move up to VP and then CRO. You know, it's like there's like a playbook and a blueprint out there that says follow these guidelines. By the time you're 
25, you should have this. By the time you're 30, you should have, you know, the mortgage. You should be married by the time you're four. And, you know, how do we actually allow ourselves to go down our own unique path? And I think that's something that you're embodying very, very well. Well, I would be lying if I sit here and said that I was always super confident about it. And it was always easy. Like, I remember being on a podcast and someone said the question, like, what makes you weird? And I said for a long time, I felt very weird being in my late 30s and unmarried. I felt like it was a you know an eyebrow raiser moment and it it really messed with my confidence candidly because when you get to a certain age and you're selling and you're meeting with people in their 40s and 50s, it's like the natural conversation is like, okay, so do you have any kids? And then when you're like, no. And then they look at your finger and they're like, oh, and you're not married. Like what the hell's wrong with you? So I would say for a very long time, I actually, I definitely struggled with it. And I think I overcompensated by throwing way too much of myself into work and aligning my self-worth with my work, which I think is something a lot of people do, men and women. Mm. I resonate a lot with that one too. I mean, do you feel like, I mean, before I kind of venture down more, like there's a positive purpose to that though, right? I mean, you have, you're now a keynote speaker. You were the chief evangelist officer at um, Challenger. I mean, you, you had a great career at Lavender. I mean, you, you, you've you done all these great things. And so it's like sometimes we, we kind of shame ourselves a little bit like, oh, man, like, you know, I wish I, but like, those, like the achiever in us, mm-hmm. it's, it's a beautiful thing that we all have. And also it prevents us from sometimes being really present to what is right now. I couldn't have said that any better, so I'm not even going to try. <laughs> <laughs> So I, what I'm I'm curious. So as you've you know ventured on this path, um, you were a individual contributor for how long uh, within within your career? Eighteen years. Eighteen years. Okay. And so was that how much of that was that challenger? So basically, it was the company I started at was called CEB. CEB got acquired by Gartner, and then Gartner spun off Challenger. So technically like I was really with there were some people I worked with for the entire 18 years but it was just the company went through M&A so it was technically a different company but I started the challenger role like selling the challenger methodology in I think it was 2015 so that would have been about seven years okay okay and so you know it's interesting because this podcast is called the rising leader podcast and for many years you were an individual contributor and you know one of the things that you talk about though is you know being a great leader with or without the title. And so I I would just kind of be curious to hear a little bit more about what your story of going through, just especially going through many different mergers and acquisitions and selling and leading, what that journey for you has been like and how that's kind of really supported you into essentially eventually leaving and, and being a keynote speaker and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. I mean, I think in many ways, there's just this really standard cookie cutter career path that many of us think has to be our path in sales. So like maybe I come in as an SDR and then I move up to like an SMBAE and then I move to mid-market AE and then I go up. Like I think way too often that's what is presented to us. I was really lucky in my career that I had some phenomenal managers and coaches who very early on sat me down and said, you do not have to take that path if you don't want to. Like you can have a great life being an individual contributor, even though you may have in the back of your head, like I'm not moving upwards in my career. So I was really lucky to have some great mentors. What I found for myself was leadership is often associated with title. I found that becoming an actual leader in the sense of getting people to believe you and to want to follow you and to like back you up in meetings and to believe in in what you're saying had way more to do with interpersonal skills and my ability to be able to effectively translate what was going on in my head and ideas that I had and confidently share those. So for me, it became almost this infatuation because I'm not a naturally like super extroverted person. I can play it a lot in this job, but I'm not really. So it was a, it was absolutely a tough thing for me to gain confidence enough to say, I've got an idea. It's, it goes against with what we believe here and be able to voice that in a room. Once I did it, once I started seeing that all of these deep seated fears I had around people are going to be like, shut up. You don't have the title to raise this, or you don't know what you're talking about. Like that shit just didn't happen. 
it almost became something that I was like infatuated with. Mm. So I grew really, really obsessed with the idea of can I get groups of people to think and believe different sets of things than they do now? And I think that's also what really drew me to sales as a career because that essentially is sales, right? Getting someone to reconsider how they do things. But once I saw its applicability internally, I was able to get on like a ton of different projects like CEO projects and things like that because people saw I wasn't afraid to go against the grain because people saw that I was really good at translating. I have this idea. Here's how I'm thinking about it. And so leadership in my mind became much more about those sets of things. And I didn't feel like I needed to take the manager, VP, you know, CRO path um, mm. personally. Yeah, you didn't need to just manage people to say you were a leader. You could just be simply a, a great leader within the company. When you did, you know, choose to go against the grain, like what were you actually trying to like consistently influence people into? Like has there always been this like deeper thing in you of like, I'm trying to like kind of just do something bigger, like this, this North star that you're always kind of working towards? Yeah, I think so. I mean, if I look at sales, I think sales in particular is one of those professions where we have so many beliefs and assumptions about this is the right and wrong way to do things. In fact, I think it's one of the things that makes sales so hard is because People hear one thing and then hear another. And it's like, how do you know what to believe? And so where it started was I was trying different things with how I sold, like what I did in my first meeting, how I booked my first meeting, how I ran group meetings, all these different things. I was trying them, mm. getting up enough reps to be able to say, okay, this wasn't a one hit wonder. There's a, a pattern here that when I do this, this works. And then raising that to my boss and then asking for it and saying, would it be okay if I shared this with the rest of the team? Can I get 20 minutes on our team meeting? Stupid, simple mm. things like that, right? It's not this like big business case or, you know, some really well orchestrated thing, but it was asking for time and earning that time by saying, I'm doing something different. I've been studying it consistently. Here's what I've learned. Do you think it's worth sharing with others? So it started like that. And then that just became the way that I thought. So I would start to look at the world and say, What's a belief or assumption that we hold about what marketing's job is versus what sales jobs is? Where can I break that? How can I get people to believe and, and buy into that? And so it became mm. such a pattern that that's why I sought out to create that chief evangelist role because I was like, that's essentially what an evangelist does is get groups of people to think and believe different things than they do today. Mm. I mean, it's really, a, it's a great example of going towards what you just are genuinely interested in. Like, I think that's one of the key things that some people kind of just got it and some people don't. At least I've experienced this. It's not, you could, you could definitely learn it, but certain people are just like hungry to get better and to think about things and to self-analyze and to do the inner work. And, and that's, you know, such a big part of even, you know, what I'm about is like, yes, the sales tactic and strategy is definitely important, but if there's not that underlying foundation of, you know, a greater belief in oneself and doing something and coming from that the zhuzh that, that can come from that, like, I don't care how good your cold call script is, like, it's going to fall flat if it's not coming from the right place. But you, what I'm hearing from you is like, you're just like, I'm continuously looking at, cool, I did this, it worked, could it be done better? Or, okay, I'm looking at how this organization is set up across marketing, sales, demand gen, all this sort of stuff. Okay, doing decently well, could it be done differently? And that's, I mean, that's not easy to do. You got to be willing to ruffle some feathers every once in a while too. <laughs> I love ruffling feathers. Now I had honestly where it comes from, because I think a lot about like why I am the way I am. I think a lot of it came from, I had a <laughs> phenomenal sales manager who was like a tough love guy who told you what you needed to hear and not what you wanted to hear, which I've always really appreciated in leaders. And I remember early in my career when I switched from account management to like new logo hunting, he gave me great advice, which is, Every bad thing you hear from a prospect is more often than not a result of something you have said to them. So wow. simply by changing the way you say what you say, how you say what you say, the tone of what you say what you say can completely change the outcome. And I think that became so fascinating to me because I was like, oh, sales isn't this thing that I'm like, do I get lucky this year or not? I control my own destiny. So much of it has to do with the choices I make and the things I make. And that's what led me to be so fascinated with this exploration and constantly like 
going back to something that maybe worked and saying, but how could I slightly change it to make it different? Because I hear this and if I say this, maybe I won't hear that. And that I think is how you can stay in a career for so long when you are just, you never assume that you're an expert. And that's what I say a lot. I'm like, mm-hmm. people will open up and be like, Jen's a sales expert. I'm like, that does not exist. <laughs> sales yes. changes too much. I mean, there's, there's what you're speaking to right there as well is we can learn the seven steps to a great prospecting methodology. We can learn the, okay, at the very first part of your pitch and you speak to the problems that are happening or the undeniable truth and then the gaps that people are experiencing and then give your product and then make sure you end with the positive business outcomes. Like there's, there's frameworks that we can all dive into. But then what's I've always found so fascinating is when you build in the psychology into it, around like, how are they thinking? And then the psychology, I love what you said, around your tonality. Ooh, when I say it like that, or when I have the purposeful stumble here, um, you know, and and just where and how to say it, it, it's a lot about like, you start to, how am I engaging with this person? Like, do I feel this person? Do they feel me? Are they thinking about something else, even though they're looking at me and nodding their head? Like, that is a really beautiful practice of how to connect with people and influence them in that some sort of way. That's, I mean, I remember when you were on the 30 minutes to presidents club thing. And one of my favorite things you talked about is how you say what you say and saying things from your gut and the delivery of that. And it's, it's those type of things that I think we often overlook because we're looking for the next hack or the next tactic. And how do I, but when you get really good at those things, if you look at my career, It's why I can get paid to stand on stages now because I spend so much time thinking about that stuff and becoming like really infatuated with if I say it like this, what happens versus if I say it like that. And so, you know, my career has led me to be the leader of my own business. It's not, I'm not going to make it a big thing. I'm not going to, I'm going to stick with the solopreneur thing, but I do think it was my path to get to a leadership role that I wanted, which is Mm -hmm. to to run my own company. Mm Mm-hmm. All right, I, I want to get to the keynote speaker stuff here in a second because I'm that's so badass that you do that. <laughs> I know we've had a lot of conversations. I obviously am a speaker. I'm not a keynote speaker yet, but you're inspiring yes. me on how to do it. Um, but I want to kind of talk about like the ruffling the feathers just a little bit more because, <clears throat> you know, when I look at right now corporations and I look at uh, sales organizations or, or, or just tech and like just the whole world of what's happening in business, what used to work doesn't seem to be quite hitting like it used to be. Like more people are feeling burnt out. More people are saying, Hey, like, yeah, I'm down to make a lot of money, but like, what if like, it's not as it's, there's other priorities too beyond just doing that. And you know, I feel like leaders are still leading like it's 2018, <laughs> you know, and and what you're speaking about on the ruffling the feathers, like r- feathers do need to be ruffled right now. And that's also a really scary thing because people who are either at the top or who have a certain sense of security and safety for how things are, and this is just how it is, don't F it up. Um. You know, it takes someone who's bold and who's courageous and willing to not be like to do that. So did you ever face that like, man, I, I have to be courageous here. Like I have to like be okay with people not liking me or not agreeing with me. This is a, an awesome question because as a human being, I am a people pleaser. And as a sales rep for the first, you know, seven years, I was a relationship builder and I cared so much about being pleasant and then 2008 hit and I was like I'm the most pleasant bitch on the street and (laughs) I'm getting nothing for it and I think that's one of those reasons why you know I know a lot of people this year are struggling and it's like people who have not gone through something like this before they look at it and they're like it's so hard and it sucks and it's awful and I know you feel this way too but it's like you go through something like that something where everything that used to work no longer works you learn more about yourself. You grow more as a person, as a, you know, individual contributor, as whatever you're doing by going through that. And so I think in many ways that was what kind of like, that was a big trigger event because it it forces you to say, okay, being nice and being pleasant 
is not getting me anywhere. In fact, I think some customers and prospects are just scared to tell me no because I am so nice. So I have to change. And then I think one of the beauties of sales is when you change, you see an immediate, like you get an immediate answer. Does it work or does it not? And so I think one of the, the when we, we talk about ruffling feathers, I think one of the missteps I see a lot of people make is it, it's very like antagonistic mm. and it's very speaking in absolutes. So this would be an example of this would be like cold email is dead or cold calling is dead or the way we've always done it is dead. Like I spent it way too much time on LinkedIn and I, I, there's a feeling you get when you read those posts, right? And it's this feeling of defensiveness if they're mm. saying what you believe is wrong. And I think I was hyper aware of that feeling. And so what it caused me to do is say, how do you ruffle someone's feathers without a, being offensive or saying that they're stupid or they're wrong? Because, and I use this example all the time, if I was at a party and someone came up and was like, I hate your shirt, I can help you find a better shirt, I would be so hurt and so offended. Mm. I wouldn't even be paying attention to the fact that they think they can help me find a better shirt. And so You just want to leave. Be like, don't look at me. I, <laughs> I hate this here. shirt now. <laughs> I look ugly. So I think it, like as stupid as an example that is, I'm always thinking at it through that lens, which is to get someone to change, they have to want to listen to you first. And so ruffling feathers does not need to have this negative connotation. It isn't always like an in-your-face motion. In fact, I think there's a ton of psychology, a ton of art to how you get someone to come to their own realization that what they're doing isn't working. And it's the same with customers and prospects. It's the same with people inside of your business. Mm. Hmm. So how do you actually do that? You know, it's like, be, if, if you're wanting to lovingly change someone's perspective, let's even bring it very political, shall we? Mm -hmm. Let's say someone is very much, you know, believes in the blue and, and they're very liberal and you think another way, how would one even begin to change someone's perspective there if they very much, you know, you know, you believe opposite of them. I mean, you picked the hardest damn. You I did. I, that my, I read as I was saying it, I was like, maybe that I should give a different example because no, this is like getting into like the core of who we are. As we, yeah. That one's definitely complex. But it's, 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 we can it's, go an easier one for the purpose of your explanation if, if like, you feel called. No, so I think if you think about how humans operate. How do you, right? how do you solve the problems of this country? <laughs> is actually a better way of saying that. Welcome to our new show, Fixing America. <laughs> no, I think, so when it comes to what, how we as humans operate, we are all, whether we're in a prospect situation, in a real life situation, we often, we always, and I try not to use the word always, but we always make decisions based off of beliefs and assumptions that we hold. So our behaviors are a result of our beliefs and assumptions. Our beliefs and assumptions are dictated by things we've experienced, things we've learned, read, saw, someone told us. What we often try to do when we try to get someone to change their behavior or believe something different is we tell them why their behavior is wrong. And all that is doing is just forcing them to then defend the beliefs and assumptions that they have. So the way that I think about it, and I did learn this from Challenger, so I want to give credit where credit is due, is if you think of it like an iceberg. The, the behavior is what you see on top of the water. Beliefs and assumptions are underneath it. Before I can get anyone in the world, my freaking kids, to change their behavior, I have to introduce information that contradicts their beliefs and assumptions because it has to be their decision to realize this belief and assumption that I've been holding is in some way logically flawed. If I can, if I can show information that gets someone to come to that conclusion, my belief and assumption is flawed. Now I've created a crack in that iceberg, and now I have the opportunity to help them see what has that flawed belief and assumption caused you to believe about how you choose to deliver this behavior. All right, so you you talked a little bit about kind of the beliefs and how that the under you talked actually about the behaviors and how there's the underlying beliefs and the assumptions I, I guess dive into that keep on going on that like what's what's under all that how are we supposed to use those things to influence somebody perfect so if you think about it like an iceberg right you've got your behaviors is what we see on the surface this is the things people do the decisions they make 
beliefs and assumptions underneath it are what inform that. So if I read something, learned something, something worked for me at some point, that informs my behavior. So if I want someone to change my behavior, the thing that's not going to work is me sitting here saying, Alex, your behavior is wrong and you need to change it. Because that behavior, again, is informed by those beliefs and assumptions. So they are going to defend it. Versus Mm. if I introduce new information about the beliefs and assumptions that are dictating that behavior, all of a sudden it is a self-realizing moment where I, the person I'm trying to convince, decide, wow, okay, my logic, my assumption, my belief there was in some way flawed. And so it becomes their idea. I am just the person giving them the information to come to that realization on their own. I think if you like kids, having kids is a great, like has helped me understand human behavior more than probably many things in life. I I cannot just tell them to do things. I have to get them to find a way to believe it's what they want to do and what's in their best interest. And that's the thing I think we miss. We're so busy being like, your behavior is wrong. Do this instead. When we've never really won their hearts and minds as to why they should change. Hmm. All right, you solved this country's problems. <laughs> Still don't think I'm converting anybody to a new you, you done did it. You done did it. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so if you're changing someone's beliefs and their assumptions, the way that I, I remember learning this kind of a similar type of framework one time, it's like changing their identity, their identity, which is underneath that. The hard part is that I'll even compare it to the the you know, right versus left, even, even I don't want to make this political at all. Like both (laughs) have so much truth to it. I see the truth in both perspectives. And in certain areas, I think one truth is more true than others. (laughs) But, (laughs) you know, it's just, it's, it's hard to, to go down to like, actually, you're, you're going to almost like the seed of it. Like you got, you see all this, this plant come up, you see all these leaves hanging off and we keep on trying to just trim the leaves or change that. But at the end of it, it's actually just in like the core of it. And so how do you change that? That's when it's like, you start to get good. And this is where I think there's like a sa- a psychological safety, right? It, it, again, it has everything to do with the tone and the delivery. If If my goal is to be right, I could give you all the new information in the world and I can give you every reason to reconsider it. You are still going to resist it because you know my – sorry. Puppies in the background. Puppies just loving they, the butt. They really liked what you were saying. Right there. <laughs> they agreed. That's who I do it for. <laughs> okay. So they – like if, if my goal is to be right, it is so difficult to ever change that person's belief because they know I have a selfish motivation for it. And this is where I think having great managers and having great coaches has been a gift in my career. And I wish it for everybody else too. To be right means that the other person is wrong and no one likes to be wrong. I don't care who you are. So when we introduce something that's a new, that's a new piece of information that contradicts beliefs and assumptions, a big part of it is also making something else the enemy. So what I mean by that specifically is You know, I know for a very long time, this worked really well because of X, Y, and Z until this changed. And how frustrating is that? That this thing that used to work so well is no longer serving us. I'm not saying you are the problem. You did something wrong. I'm saying this environmental shift happened and you just were a a consequence of it, right? And I think when you allow someone to be off of the hook as to you're not the, the problem, even though in many cases they are. What that's doing is it's opening a door that probably Mm. will eventually allow you to have that conversation. I just find it's really hard to have that conversation right off the bat because you just don't have the trust. You don't have the, 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 like the safety, the psychologically safe, psychological safety in a relationship to admit, yeah, I'm, I've screwed up big time to someone I barely know. Yeah. It's, it's a combination of psychological safety for sure. But one thing that you said that I really liked is if my agenda or if I'm, my goal is trying to change their mind, just whether or not your words represent that, your tonality will, or even just the energy from what you are coming from will. Yeah. And that is what's going to really rub people the wrong way versus it's like, it, and that's this is the complexity of, of any type of, of leadership role. It's like, 
okay, yes, if I'm selling somebody something, I'm trying to convince them to buy my product at the end. The core of what I'm, I have an agenda, absolutely. Yet, how do I not let my agenda supersede my ability to connect with someone or just to just guide them in the right way? It's like I'm trying to make you do something versus simply being a guide and a shepherd of think about this sort of thing. Have you considered this? Like you're helping them come to the answer versus you saying, I'm trying to convince you to buy my product. I love the word choice you use there. Guiding and shepherding or being a Sherpa, whatever we want to say it. So much of like, if you look at people that are well-recognized in business, it's like this very similar personality type of dictatorship. I'm right and you're wrong. And people see that and people see how much people flock to that. And I think we misinterpret that that is just the way you get people to believe in you. And I see it a lot on LinkedIn. I see it a lot in sales calls even of just like, I'm going to show you why you're wrong and I'm right because I, my belief system is that then you'll choose to work with me. And I think so much of what makes us successful, not just in sales, but just in, in our interpersonal relationships at work is the ability for someone to understand that you're not trying to tell them to do anything. You're trying to introduce information that helps them make the best possible decision for themselves. And I think even just that reframing, Alex, of what yeah. you said as to if you are in sales, like my job is not to come in and tell them that they're wrong and I'm right. My job is to give them information that allows them to make that decision. Then I can leave every single call feeling really good about myself because I know if I didn't do it, it's either because I made a wrong assumption about their circumstance and there's an actual reason why it doesn't make sense or it was the way I delivered it. And if it's the way mm -hmm. I delivered it, that's just something I can now get to work on and get mm -hmm. better at and change and try new things. And so I think it's a way, honestly, it was like almost a coping mechanism in sales for me to not get so down about bad outcomes or lost deals was I tried to reframe it of like, okay, this is just an opportunity for me to think differently and try something different and, and learn from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've always found it's a constant self-practice. Yes. It's like, you know, I even experience, you know, when I'm not just when I was in tech sales, but hey, you know, now I'm having conversations with people about attending Alluvian's retreats. And it's like, how is my practice not to enroll this person in the retreat, but simply be in a state of just like, I'm coming from a really grounded, safe place of here. Like, if you choose to do this, absolutely awesome. If not, that is your journey and being unattached from it. But I've found it's, it's less about like, how do I act with another person versus more like, how am I acting with myself? <laughs> like, how am I doing? Like constantly is, am I like connecting with myself? Am I like really coming from a good spot? And it's like, when we feel good, you know, as like, I've been experiencing <clears throat> doing this one practice of like really being present to now. And like, I was taking uh, the dog on a, a walk earlier and I like chose to leave my phone at home. And I was like, let me look at just like, the leaves and like wow like how beautiful these leaves are you know i was like eating my salad earlier and i took a bite of a tomato and i was like this tomato is really <laughs> delicious yeah. yeah you know try like and and it's fun when i do that stuff and i'm actually experiencing the joy of those things i'm a better fucking sales professional <laughs> it's like one thing is so correlated to the next it is and i'm i'm someone that i'm very similar like I'm attached to my phone most times. And this year I started getting the habits of just taking walks. And the quality of ideas that you get on a walk are always better than the quality of ideas you get sitting here staring at a computer screen. And it's because of what you said. It's like disconnecting from just the, the everything and just focusing on finding beauty, finding inspiration, finding these things, as cheesy as it sounds. I do think I saw a dramatic difference in myself this year, particularly around creativity and safety taking chances, doing things that I had not done before because I was far more intentional about not getting caught up in the everyday of things. So mm. I completely believe what you just said. Mm. So you, you mentioned a, a few times throughout this podcast, you had great managers and great coaches. <clears throat> and sure, you are an intelligent person, you're driven, you're, you're somebody's, somebody would want to invest into you because you're a good investment, so to speak. Like you're hungry, right? You're, you're hungry to learn more. And so it's like, why wouldn't I want to invest in this person? But 
you know, you've just said it like a few times throughout here. So for many people, I think they look at their manager and they're like, eh, I don't know. I don't know if I like this person here. Or they're looking for a mentor or they're looking for a coach. You know, what are your recommendations to how do you actually develop this community and these these people who you can rely on and who can support you in blazing your own path? We are living in the land of the riches right now. When I think about, there were years I had terrible managers. I would never name names, but there was one in particular that was just, just the apps. He was like Michael Scott from the office, but not as nice. And I struggled with that because I was like, well, he's my manager. I'm not going to be able to learn. Maybe I just leave the company. Maybe. And fortunately I had the realization, like you've got a lot of good things here. Don't make a rash decision just because one thing isn't, isn't ideal. And so my approach then was let me go find people that I think I could see myself being similar to not maybe not always the number one performer because sometimes the number one performer was like the kick the door down person. I was like, I'm never going to be that person. So I could spend as much time as I want around them. That's just not who I am. So that was a manual process. Now, I, when I say we live in a land of the riches, there's never been a better time to be able to connect with other people, whether it's on mm -hmm. LinkedIn or communities or groups like yours, where it's about going to places with people who want something similar to you. I think when you mm. show up to a community event, in most cases, not all, it's other people who are really passionate about the thing that the topic of the community is about. And so now we have this pre-filtered mechanism where it's like, I don't even need to take risks. I don't need to fly to San Francisco to go to some event being like, I hope I meet someone. Like, Olivians is a great example. You know you go to that and you're around other people who want something similar for themselves. So anybody who's like, I don't have a great manager, I, I like I think it's a bit of a, a of a bad attitude problem to have. Mm. Is it great to have a, a wonderful manager? Absolutely. There's just too many easy ways to connect with other people who can inspire us, help us, coach us, mentor us now. Mm. Hell yeah. Yeah, it resonates so much with it. It's like are you just simply being resourceful there? Like whether it's an online community an in-person community you, there's so much out there, <clears throat> but the word community, I feel like means a certain thing. And you, and I really liked how you phrased it as well. It's a group of people who actually care about the similar shit that you care about. And, and the way what I would divide the, the uh, define a specific community is it's a group of people who are working towards a common goal, a greater thing, a larger mission, together and sure you could have your individual goals within that but you're it's like if you're in a, a community of people who are wanting to step, step into the greatest version of themselves and, and leave meaningful impact in this world that's a shared vision and goal and sure when somebody is struggling absolutely they have each other's back there's no doubt about that. that's the beauty of a of a community but actually what i think is more important is they say hey in this community you got to step the hell up it's like, it's like there's a standard here. There's also a level of accountability here. And yeah. sure, we're all going to mess up. But it's like if you're going to rub shoulders with this crew here, you got to you gotta act. Act it sort of thing. That I think is a beautiful definition of community because I agree with you. Community is kind of a term that's been like overgeneralized and thrown around. And I think there's examples of communities that do that. But I also look at, so there's a guy, um, his name's Riley Blaisdell. I don't know if you are connected with him on LinkedIn. He was someone that was let go from his job. He had a pretty tough upbringing. And he, during the pandemic, chose to take total accountability of his development. He wanted to break into a, a different type of sales role. And he just started consuming podcasts, connecting with guests, sharing what he learned, asking the question like he would have asked if he was the podcast host. I was one of the people that he connected with. And I remember just thinking like, what a rare, special gift of someone who is taking so much self-accountability to get better at the things they knew they wanted to prove at. And someone who wasn't just like, I want to connect with someone who's got a big following. Like all of his questions felt so sincere of like, I just really want to make sure I understand this concept before I go and try it. And so I think Riley's an example of someone who made his own community within a broader community by finding other people who are receptive to that conversation. And now he turns around and he gives it back to everybody. Mm. And I just think like that is the most beautiful thing. That is something we couldn't do 10 years ago because we just didn't have the connection points that we do today. Mm -hmm. mm. Damn, this is good. I love <laughs> it. <laughs> uh, I, I, so I got a, a couple more questions here yeah. for you. Um, 
So you're a keynote speaker now, which is so cool. And, um, you know, I've, you've spoken on many stages to sales organizations, to, uh, leaders, to, to many different, um, you know, situations, containers, I guess you could say, I, I guess I'm curious, like, did you always know you wanted to be a keynote speaker first off? Like, did you always just like that? And second, what are you talking about? Like, what what at the core of it is Jen, aka Demand Jen? See what I did there? What's <laughs> her message that she's really, you know, using her platform to talk about? I did not always know I wanted to do it, primarily because I didn't think people like me could do it. I thought mm. keynote speaking was for Olympians and professional athletes and book authors, and I am none of those three. And so when I became the evangelist at Challenger, I started getting, and I had the, the podcast at Challenger, what happened was people started to be able to, um, to know what I stood for. So I was talking like you're talking right in a podcast about what I believed and felt about selling. And so people were like pre-screening me and being like, oh, we, we believe in that too. We want our sellers to believe in that. So come on in. And so the more I did it, the more I realized this like belief I had around, well, I can't do it because I'm not an Olympic athlete started to fade away. And then I was like, all right, mm. this seems to be something people are willing to pay for. So it wasn't something I always thought I could do, which dictated me believing like it wasn't something I could do. What I talk about goes, comes full circle back to what we've been talking about this whole time. My style is very, very different than I think a lot of the SKO speakers that I've sat in audiences and watch. When, and what I mean by that is like, you know, it's motivational or it's like, um, here's what you should be doing. And I'm an expert. I'm very intentional. I think this is what makes me different. I think this is what people appreciate the most that I will stand up on a stage and be like, here's what I used to believe and assume. And here's all the reasons I got it wrong. And here's what happened. Like I am the antithesis of saying I'm a sales expert. I think my knowledge has come from screwing up. And I just feel like sales mm. is one of those professions where we have made it so taboo to admit that people that are good at sales now were shit at sales at a certain point. <laughs> And so largely what I talk about is I'll take a number of different themes, whether it's like prospecting and cold emailing or whether it's I'm now moving up market and selling to enterprise and I've got teams of people saying no instead of just one person saying yes. And I will start by saying, here's what I used to believe. I Don't blame me if you believe it too. And here's what happened when I believed that and when I did this. And then I, I believed this, changed this, and here's what happened instead. And my whole entire goal is to make it so that one, someone leaves that saying, I don't suck. I just maybe had the wrong information. And two, that they leave with something they can actually use. Like no knock against motivational speaking, but I think right now where we are, you mentioned it. It's like, I, I, you can motivate me to do more of the same things, but if the same things I've been doing are not the right things, I'm not going to be more effective just because I worked harder. I've got to figure out how do I change my motion and so I think what I try to do is just be so relatable. I'm speaking as a salesperson, not as yes. someone above them telling them this is why you're stupid and why you're wrong. Mm. I mean, you're you're showing, hey, I'm a practitioner just as much as you guys. Like, I, I, you know, I've even, I've also experienced when I, you know, speak on stage or, or talk about the work and, and kind of doing the inner work of sales, the best talks are when I'm just sharing about what I've got going on. <laughs> You know, and what I'm learning and getting punched in the face on and struggling with and just like it's it's sort of saying I, I'm I don't know all the answers, but I'm in a deep level of inquiry into the questions just like y'all. Let's just do that. That people want to connect. And just because you or I are on a stage and they're sitting in an audience does not make that go away. And if I'm gonna listen to a damn word that comes someone out of someone's mouth, I have to want to listen to them. And I just think like that was the thing that all of the experiences that I talked about earlier around getting people to reconsider their beliefs and assumptions about how they sell, that just made fuel for the fire of keynote speaking because that's really what that is. I'm not going to be able to fix the world's problems or you know turn around someone's revenue projections in a 30-minute keynote, but I can get people to walk out of that room thinking and believing different things and willing to try it. And that is cool to me because like we talked about before, sales is one of those professions where you change what you say, how you say it, the tone of how you say it, and you can see really crazy different results. Mm. 
some good ass shit right there. Okay, so <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm like, man, I was bummed that we're up at just about a time. I'm like, I just want to kick it. Um, so I, I have one final question for you. Uh, and first, but first, I do just I want to acknowledge the hell out of you. Like, just way to bring it. Um, the authenticity, the energy, the examples. Um, I can see why. Um, I can see why you doing. You you have such a, a good. Um, I, I want to call it like reputation, as weird as that sounds, but it's more just like I can see why you're doing what you're doing and the impact that you're having. So thank, thank you, you for, for bringing it. Appreciate that. Um, so my final question is this. The show is called The Rising Leader Podcast. What do you view as the rising leader? I view the rising leader as someone who's ego does not outweigh their desire to consistently challenge their own beliefs and assumptions. I know I've said beliefs and assumptions 800 times on this podcast, but I think of the people that I want to follow, the people that I believe in, they are the people that never stop challenging their own conventional wisdom. And I don't care what title you have, we can all do that. We can all choose to go through life that way, whether it's our personal lives, our professional lives. So I'm not impressed or wooed by titles. I am impressed by people who are constantly challenging themselves. Hmm. Oh yeah. All right, Jen, actual final question for you. <laughs> if you want to get a hold of you, what is the best way to do so? Uh, you know, I spent all damn day on LinkedIn. So Jen Allen Knuth, and then I've stood up a very ugly website, which I will be working on in my own attempts to challenge myself. Um, it's demandgen.com with a J. So that's where you can find it. com with a J. I love it. Well, <laughs> thank you, Jen, uh, again. And for all the people who, who checked in here, if you know somebody who needs to hear this, which a lot of people need to hear this, make sure you send it their way. Uh, give Jen a follow if you have not already. And uh, Jen. Much love, my friend. Thank you. Love spending the time with you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Rising Leader Podcast. Make sure you hit that follow button so you get notified every time a new episode releases. If you know someone who wants to take their lives and their career to the next level, send them this episode so we can all rise together. For more information, check out alluvians.co. We'll see you next time. And in the meantime, keep letting it flow. <laughs>